Hello and welcome to News Click. We have a very special guest here today, uh, Mr. Nirmala Rajasingham, who is a co-founder of the Sri Lanka Democracy, Democracy Forum and uh, a member of the South Asia Solidarity Group and who is based in London and with whom we shall discuss the situation in Sri Lanka today, the challenges faced by civil society and democratic, democratic activists in, the, in that country and more. Welcome to News Click. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Uh, my first question to you would be uh, based on the developments that we see in Tamil Nadu today. Uh, following the re you know, regular release of images from the uh, civil, from the final phase of the civil war in 2009, there has been a lot of outrage that has been generated. Much of it very genuine, uh, you know, students and professionals coming onto the streets, angry that uh, that the Sri Lankan government has not been held accountable for certain of those war crimes, and some even demanding international probe into the incidents and so on and so forth. What would be your message to those uh, young students and professionals who are coming onto the streets? I mean, um, I, um, I understand the, the outrage, their feelings of outrage. I understand uh, I have ordinary people on the ground in Tamil Nadu have always, uh, their, their hearts have gone out uh, for, the, for the Sri Lankan Tamils. I myself was a recipient of their warmth and uh, welcome when I first uh, fled to Tamil Nadu as a refugee in the mid-80s. Um, however, uh, I, what I want to say is that um, um, it's very important that, that, they, that this, this uh, groundswell of opinion, these feelings for the Sri Lankan Tamil's plight should not then uh, turn into a kind of uh, Tamil chauvinism which can be manipulated by political actors in Tamil Nadu. Uh, for instance, you know, the, the attacks on Sinhala tourists, the Buddhist monks who come to India, to Tamil Nadu on pilgrimage. That is really unacceptable because not simply because it's unacceptable on its own as, as you know, inhumane acts, right, but right. also because uh, it strengthens singular Buddhist nationalism in Sri Lanka. Right. And, and it, then right. uh, that, of course, you know, visits upon the Tamil population and makes them even more insecure. So it ultimately, it's not in the interest of the Sri Lankan Tamils for a kind of Tamil chauvinism to evolve in Tamil Nadu relating to the Sri Lankan Tamil's plight. So uh, ordinary people must understand, yes, it's great to give solidarity. It's great to ask questions about what is happening to the Sri Lankan Tamils. But uh, you must not make it into a kind of, uh, allow it to become a jingoistic, chauvinistic Tamil movement that is manipulated by, you know, established political actors. The popular imaginary in uh, Tamil Nadu is that of uh, uh, what happened during the uh, civil war was, you know, intense bombing on the Tamil population, which is more or less true uh, and, uh, you know, uh, a show of Sinhala nationalist triumphalism and so on. But um, I am sure that there are other issues faced by the Tamils in Sri Lanka and somehow that uh, those issues by not just the, uh, you know, uh, the Sri Lankan Tamils in the north and the east, but also other you know migrant Tamils who have settled down in Sri Lanka for a long time, such as upcountry Tamils and so on and so forth. So, uh, could you give us a picture of the you know uh, of the of the of the challenges they face uh, in in Sri Lanka? Right. Um, the thing is, uh, yes, uh, you know it was a devastating war. It will take decades and decades and decades for the for the Sri Lankan Tamils or the Tamils in Sri Lanka to recover. From, from that war, particularly those who were in the theatre of war, the thousands of people. And we know that thousands and thousands of people, the estimate of 40,000 people died in the war, due, mainly due to government bombing, indiscriminate bombing. Uh, but it wa the war itself was a process. There were two armies fighting. And the LTT was implicated in this war, you know, keeping people uh, imprisoned within that narrow space and, and not letting them go. Um, shooting on people who were fleeing the war um, and of course so so one must understand it uh, you know how the war you know it was a process there were two armies there the bigger and the more brutal army won at the end you know uh, there's no question about it with heavier weaponry and more numbers that's that's how it happened now one that's the first thing the second thing is yes the, the Tamils need uh, a day of reckoning where they can, they have the opportunity to tell their story. They need some kind of recompense for what they have suffered. There is no question about that. But they also need to reconcile, reconciliation. They also need to build a future in that country. Yes. The Tamils are not going to go anywhere else. Those who are there are there to live and they have to live. The reality is they have to live with the Muslims and the Sinhalese. Now, 
since the end of the war, the Rajapaksa regime has capitalized on this massive victory and, and you know, on a note of triumphalism, has consolidated a single nationalist uh, base for itself. You know, if there was uh, doubt, I mean, it's, it's becoming worse. I, I totally agree. So then, the, we mustn't do anything to <laughs> strengthen that process. We must... We must do things to detract from that process. That is very important, particularly people who are external actors, uh, people who give solidarity from abroad, should be mindful of this. And I also want to say that uh, in the in the in the in the in the Van Nee, the vast majority of people, I think, who died in that war and who could not um, were the poorest people. Uh, and if you see, the Tamil nationalist movement was dominated and led by Peninsular Tamils, the middle class, upper caste Peninsular Tamils. Many of them, you know, as the struggle escalated, voted with their feet and went abroad and they have established their Tamil nationalist enclaves in Toronto, London, etc, etc. But the people who remained were the people who couldn't leave, who had no way to leave. And so that, what that meant was, there were two groups that I particularly want to highlight. One are the Dalits the Dalit communities in, 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 in the Tamil regions. And, some, and the other, of course, uh, the, uh, lots of Tamils from the, the Tamil hinterland, so to speak, the Manar district, the Vani district, the eastern province, less developed areas of the Tamil regions. They are children. So the children of the poor join the swell the ranks of the LTD. And there is another significant population. You know the hill country Tamils. These are people who were taken by the British as indentured labor to work on the plantations in the mid to the late 1800s, early 1900s. And their history has been one of um, deep, deep uh, op oppression, uh, marked by, you know, atrocities against them, you know, deep levels of op oppression and suppression of this community. They earned the wealth for the country. You know, the, the biggest foreign exchange earner for many, many years was tea. So they were the you know, wealth creators for the country, but they were the ones who you know, received the least from the country by way of you know, economic uh, support. And when the, Tamil, when the programs against the Tamils happened in 58, 77, 83, many of these hill country Tamils, they were the first to be attacked, even more than the Jaffna Tamils, they were, they are, because they live in the hill country on plantations surrounded by Singhala villages. So they were the first to be attacked. So many of them fled to the Vanni. And as refugees, and they they started as seasonal labor. Then they did share. I mean, you know, they 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 had very difficult existence. Little by little, gradually, they established themselves in the Vanni. It's a significant proportion of people who perished at the at the in Mulivaikal were these people. So, the, the the Tamil nationalists abroad have no connection to this community. They have no connection to this community. This is a truth that has been you know, hidden and it's very important for us to, you can't subsume everything under the uh, you know, a broad overarching you know, Tamil identity because there are cleavages within the Tamil community, one. And the Jaffna Tamils have never had anything to do because they have always looked down on the hill country Tamils as coolies, as laborers. They, they will not marry amongst them. It's almost like treating them uh, as, if, as if they were a, a lower caste. It's like, a, it's like a, whether it doesn't matter what caste they were, but you know, there were a whole range of castes, but uh, you know. So, and, and so it's very important that we understand. And these people are there to stay. And we must insist on proper rehabilitation. The government has not done anything about rehabilitating people. There is a lot of destitution. There's a lot of economic destitution. There are people without homes, people whose lands have been taken away by the army. And the sheer trauma. I, I would like to uh, go to the next question from here. Actually. Sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, the, the expectation after the civil war was mm -hmm. that uh, since the LTT has been defeated, the next step automatically mean a reconciliation process and then the long-standing nationality question, you know, uh, uh, it could be uh, a federal model, uh, a suitable model that accommodates the minorities in Tamil Nadu, uh, sorry, in Sri Lanka would be addressed by the Sri Lankan government. 
Conversely, the Sri Lankan government we read uh, being in India is that uh, what we read is that it has it has actually uh, uh, what has happened in Sri Lanka is an entrenchment of militarization and uh, and and an entrenchment of further nationalism and so mm. on. So in this situation, you know, what do you think is the challenge of a democratic activist? And could you also explain what is really going on over there? You would expect that after the defeat of the LTT, because they were. The government was claiming that LTT was the big stumbling block to peace and resolving the ethnic problem. And they, after they defeated the LTT, you would expect that they would have gone on uh, to have a discussion with the various minority communities, etc., to resolve this matter. Well, instead, the government went on a on a on a major triumphalist offensive uh, and absolutely ignored the question of um, a, a political resolution to um, to the this fraught uh, ethnic national question of Sri Lanka. That's one thing. Uh, the second thing is, uh, instead, you know, after the, you know, they're instead of, instead of demilitarizing after the war, in the end of the war, they have upped the numbers of the army, uh, army, you know, which is like really mystifying. They they are increasing the numbers in the army, recruiting more. They are spending more on the on the army, and they have also militarized the, the process of militarization instead of de-escalating it's escalating into state structures and civil structures that's which is which is a really frightening development for instance the urban development authority has now come under the defense ministry so slum clearances beautification of kalam the big cities all of this under the army now uh, the army is now penetrating higher education the, every all the university students before they uh, gain ad, before they start their education they have to go for leadership training to to the army uh, you know what kind of you know, leadership training can the army give to university students who are going on a on a journey for you know intellectual learning and exploration and you know all of that. So so things like this. The north and east are heavily heavily militarized. The northern administration, the civil administration, is run by uh, military personnel. Many ambassadors are uh, military or ex-military personnel. So military existing military personnel or ex-military personnel are given leadership positions throughout the country in lots of different places. So this militarization and uh, the absence of any discussion of uh, to resolve the political, the fraught political question of, you know, ethnic conflict mm -hmm. is, is very, very... Uh, Doesn't this actually provide a new opportunity for democratic activists because now yes. they can combine the issues of, uh, you know, minority angst with the fact that uh, this deep militarization is actually, you know, uh, uh, narrowing the areas of dissent, and therefore uh, more and more uh, uh, dissenters who uh, who are actually, uh, uh, you know, frightened about this uh, militarization could actually join hands yes. with some of the, uh, uh, you know, people who have already been arguing for resolution of the nationality question in that sense. Yes, yeah. I, mean, I I think the crucial question here is there's militarization and consolidation of the singular nationalist consensus, right? That's one thing. On the other hand, the, the militarization of the North and East now is creeping to the South. And also, this whole new liberal uh, b b b onslaught, you know, d development projects, etc., etc., it is also affecting various communities and populations in the South, you know, by dispossessing them, into taking away lands, you know, that is, it, that's beginning. So there is, and also there are uh, lots of other um, uh, undemocratic, because on the back of the militarization, for instance, uh, that is happening, uh, uh, tra attacking trade unions, attacking um, journalists, killing, killing journalists and you know, trade union protesters. Um, so uh, this is happening. In the South, this has started to happen. So we have an opportunity now to, 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 to chisel away at this this big monolithic singular Buddhist nationalist consensus, while on the one hand the government is uh, regime is stimulating singular Buddhist nationalist nationalism all the time, there is the other side is also opening up. That the opportunity also is presents itself, and we have to now seize this opportunity to organize non, uh, nationwide and build a democracy movement, and 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 the rights of the Tamils and the Muslims. I, I, I must emphasize to our listeners in Tamil Nadu and everywhere else that there isn't a tidy, neat, nicely tailored so political solution only for the Tamils, exclusive for the Tamils, because we don't live alone on that island. We live with other people. And it has to be, there has to be at the people level, some level of mediation, negotiation, political exchange, some coming together to understand, to understand what this magic formula is. 
because it's you it's not something that you pluck out of the air and say here you are go Tamils this is your political solution that is what the Tamil nationalists have been saying and it's not it should come on the back of this democratic consensus as part of a democratic challenge to this very authoritarian state how do you rate the international response uh, there have been uh, you know multilateral organizations such as the UNHRC which is you know uh, where nations have come together to pass uh, you know, uh, tough resolutions on uh, Sri Lanka, I mean, uh, demanding accountability for uh, the lack of progress in reconciliation, the lack of progress in addressing the nationality question and so on. And uh, this has become a cause celebre and I suppose uh, Mahindra Rajapaksa, the president of Sri Lanka has actually used it to, uh, you know, uh, play himself as the, uh, as, you know, uh, as someone, I mean, as, as an anti-imperialist who is being uh, threatened with, uh, you know, uh, imperialist pressure. So how do you read this situation? Right. I mean, the thing is, uh, when you say international actors, the international community, there are, what is the international community is the first thing we have to ask that question. There are many different actors, you know, even in the UN system. I mean, now when you look at the end of the war, Mahindra Rajapaksa was supported by many countries to finish the war. They, everybody looked away while they finished the job. That is the reality. So let's get that right first. Secondly, there are then international actors now trying to get, to get the Sri Lankan regime to comply, you know, uh, so that, that that process is there, and it happens at the level of the UN Human Rights Council system. You know, that, you know, it, countries come together and they wish to uh, discipline the Sri Lankan regime for not doing certain things or, or for doing certain things. Now, the resolutions we, I, you know, I I am happy about the resolution. But I am also unhappy that it's, it's not really enough in the sense that basically what it is asking the Sri Lankan government to do is to implement the, the government's own commission's recommendations. The government's appointed commission, lessons learned and reconciliation commission, that came up with a whole set of recommendations. Except for a, a couple of uh, one section, I am okay with almost all the recommendations. If they, re if they implemented those recommendations, we will be moving forward. But the government is refusing to do that. And these, these uh, re resolutions that have been passed in the UNHRC um, are, are simply asking that. There is no great radical, radical step that they are asking the Sri Lankan government to do, right? But of course, Mahindra Rajapaksa and his, uh, you know, the, the president and his supporters can present this to the singular public as... Uh, you know, as some kind of threat that that is being you know um, um, uh, di you know directed at them, the international community, the West, the imperialists, so on and so forth, and and uh, some of these countries, even after the end of the war, have been selling weapons to Sri Lanka in 2011, and while they are also discussing human rights etc. at the Human Rights Council, I am not I am not belittling you know the achievements that the Human Human Rights Council achieved by. By by a lot of demo, you know a lot of human rights activists, human rights international human rights organizations, but I am I am kind of um, not that confident about what it really means, how it translates locally, because ultimately it is people within Sri Lanka who have to transform our state. We are the ones who have to do it, you know, and 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 for that. I, I, I'm just uh, thinking, you know, how does it really help in the, in the ultimate process? It's fine. It's another, it's, it should be a side show. We, it cannot be the main show where we put all our eggs in the UNHRC basket. That every time, you know, there is this huge build up towards March of, you know, 2013 this year. And then after that, we all go home and we say, ah, resolution done. You know, it's, there's lots more work to be done within the country. The sum and substance of what you say is that the uh, international civil society response to the developments in Sri Lanka should be cognizant, so, uh, cognizant of the realities there and also be cognizant of the aspirations of the people within Sri Lanka and what effect their responses would have on the, the lives of the uh, people over there. That's what you that, that is. That is, that is one of the things I'm saying, you know, um, that for, for me, the most important agenda uh, thing, thing that should be on the agenda for the, as far as the Tamil people are concerned is, is, is their rehabilitation. Because now we have a population that is still traumatized by the war, rendered inert and destitute. Because, and also because these people have been inert and mute and suppressed over the 30-year war by the LTTE. So we need to sort of make them start, come out, come alive again. So they can start thinking about their political future. So rehabilitation is very important. The other thing that really uh, we, we must 
really focus on and we need solidarity from uh, the left uh, the left in india and elsewhere i know uh, this is uh, this is my my message to to the left we need is is to take on singhala buddhist nationalism uh, in the way that you know to to solidarize with us and to understand our predicaments there for instance now the muslim community is being targeted in a big way in a terrifying way and i i now remember the time in the late 70s early 80s when the tamil community was there and we cannot allow that whole process to happen all over again not another 30 year war not another war so we must come up with creative solutions creative strategies to deal with singhala buddhist nationalism as as two minorities we are not the tamils and the muslims are not even speaking to each other properly you know so lots of things have to change low within the country thank you so much thank you so much for your uh, you know introspective remarks and uh, and message to, messages to the both the civil society and the left in india thank you so much thank you very much for having me